The most requested video I've had on this channel so far is to interview my dad as Neil McKenzie, not as Mad Mark for once. So today I finally caught up with him, talk about his career, some things you probably won't know about my dad, um, which include his childhood in India, of all countries, and what it was like being teammates with various different races over the years and his MotoGP predictions for this year. I hope you enjoy it. Don't forget to subscribe and let me know what you think. Uh, so I thought we'd... Um, I was trying to make the interview things that people wouldn't know about you necessarily, right. which is lots. But we'll start with your childhood and right. how it involves India. All right. So talk me through it. Right. Uh, childhood in India. My father uh, was actually born in 1902, so that's quite a long time ago. So he was uh, he was actually 59. Uh, when he fathered me when I was conceived. So, um, because he'd spent a lot of his life in India, he uh, applied for a job in his 20s and uh, basically got a train to Tilbury Docks, got on a boat and uh, got a job on a, as a junior engineer uh, on a tea plantation in India just because he was living in Inverness, born and brought up in Inverness, served his time as an engineer. And uh, so I had written a paper and uh, they were recruiting and just thought it would be a bit of an adventure. So he then spent 23 years in India, um, working his way up through the system, eventually managing tea plantations before coming home in the late 40s, early 50s. So I grew up with these stories of uh, India, and at the time it was a great time for Brits to be out there. They had uh, servants and staff and good jobs and good working facilities, and uh, and they got on with all the, the natives as well. Always happy stories of the, the Indians and, and the workers in these times out there. So, um, so yeah, uh, that's where the India connection is. Um, yeah, so just... When he was out there, he married a, an English girl, Molly, who was um, a daughter of a, another tea planter and had three sons out there, Colin, John and Brian. So I've got the three half-brothers that were born in, in India. Now, um, coincidentally, all living in central Scotland. And I think what a changing point for you in your life might have been was that your dad then died when you were 14 or 13. Yeah. Yeah, I was. My dad died in 1975, so I had 13 good years with him. I was. Uh, I turned 14 in uh, 75. He died in the February when I was 13. Um, but brilliant childhood, loving childhood. Uh, he was a, an older dad, but so probably less fit than some of my, my friends' dads. But um, still, uh, gave me a love of cars and not so much bikes. But he was. He was an engineer to trade, so. So I loved cars, but he had a heart condition. So over a period of three years, uh, he, his health was, was failing. So it's it quite sad in the end. And, and he passed away when I was 13. And obviously very sad, but in some ways a, a little bit of a, a relief because I didn't like to see him in a bad way. And he ended up in hospital three times in intensive care. So um, so when he passed away, it was sad. There was tears with my mum and myself, but... Um, yeah, it was it was kind of a, a relief for for both of us, and and yeah, and a massive turning point in, in my life for sure. As previous to my granddad, your dad being alive, did you have bikes in your life at that point or not? No, not not at all. There was there was odd pictures in boxes of my dad's brother Alec on bikes, and uh, my dad I know had bikes when he was young but mainly as a means of transport not any great passion involved they were just a means of transport and and I think they were interested in bikes but only really from a kind of mechanical side there was no great passion certainly no racing involved but there was bikes in, in the lives he had he had a few brothers and and yeah there was there was bikes but it was it wasn't a big deal with really. so how did you get into racing if your dad wasn't into racing because my dad yeah. was fairly well into racing. Oh, was he? Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that sometimes helps. It, well, it was bikes first, and then racing just happened. Really, I uh, there was in the seventies. Um, it was a it was a 
great. It was a great time for bikes and, and biking, and it was really affordable and they were really popular, and loads of people had bikes. Um, but I was a, a typical teenager, 12, 13 year old, certainly when my, my dad died. And then um, I had some friends that, that had bikes that were a few years older, but they had uh, a little Honda C70, C90, things like that. They used to. Uh, run about on railway lines and I used to basically stand at the side and watch but there was something inside that desperately wanted me to have a go or someone to let me have a go um, and so that happened there was I mean the first time I ever got on any kind of moped was along a railway line and it was like oh my god that thing's moving and I'm not even having to pedal it it was just the, the weirdest trickiest feeling ever and, and I guess that's what happens and you you don't realise but from that moment on you're addicted and then I was also involved in a in a in a revolution of what was called the sixteener specials. When at that point you could basically rock up to a dealer's with a small deposit, twenty five quid or thirty quid, sign your life away, and ride home on an FS one E, which was capable of forty fifty mile an hour. There was they were manufactured at that point, um, sold a range of. 16 a special, so 16 with a provisional license, an L plate, you could you could ride away a bike that would do 40 or 50 mile an hour, 50 cc's, but the popular ones were Honda SS 50s, Suzuki AP 50s, Yamaha FS 1E, uh, and there was a whole host of Malagottis and uh, Italian bikes, Pooh as well, they, they made a few 16 a special, so there was a whole range of these bikes and it was a real kind of cult following and and we tend, tended to gather at chip shops, I think, up and down the country. We had our own chip shop in Denny and Pines. And all the 16-year-olds had just signed the life away for these bikes would broke up to the chip shops. So there was a, a great gathering and great enthusiasm. And, and it gave you freedom. You could, you could, as I say, ride these bikes away and uh, ride around Scotland if you wanted. And you just, just had freedom. And they were fun. And so... You quickly went from growing up on a council estate in Scotland to being Freddie Spencer's teammate. How like it's quite hard to imagine it now, a bike racer going from well, exactly that. You can't imagine a teenager in England or Scotland now living on a council estate one minute and then being Mark Marquez's teammate the next. How did that happen? What how did it, <laughs> Do you even know? <laughs> No, it's ridiculous. I didn't really think about it at the time, but looking back now, it's ridiculous. You're right. I lived in a council estate with my mum. It was me and my mum. My mum had a job at the electricity board. She was she worked in the council department. I was a labourer at the electricity board after doing loads of different jobs that were going nowhere, uh, but fun. I was a milkman, drove a digger. I was a labourer, and, and then eventually ended up labouring at the, the electricity board. And yeah, started racing in 1981, and by within five years, I'd signed a contract with HRC, as you said, to be Brady Spencer's teammate, which is just ridiculous. And there's no way that should have been possible or could have happened, but or it did. Um, yeah, my, my interest in bikes continued, and I had friends at school that, that raced Alistair and Stuart Ray, and I just I used to go along the racing with them. and. All I ever wanted to do was push the TZ250s and start them and warm them up and hand them over and let them go racing. That was the total buzz for me. That was all I ever wanted to do in a weekend. But my my interest in bikes carried on and I, I kind of uh, upgraded from a Fizzy to 350LC. 350LC is a bike I saw in Motorcycle News in 1980. And it was the first water-cooled small two-stroke and it just looked amazing and I knew I had to beg, borrow and steal to get one so all, but I only ever wanted it just as a road bike to go to work on, have fun, ride with my mates but at the same time there was a huge um, uh, new class arrived in racing, 500 production class and it was basically for 350 LCs and that also came to Scotland so my mates that I used to help uh, at the racing they kind of encouraged me to have a go. So I didn't have a van, I didn't, I didn't have anything. So it was basically chuck the bike in the back of their van, go to North Kill, race, and then go back to work on a Monday. And, and that's how it all started. And it 
yeah, I mean, lots of kind of being the right place at, at the right time and working hard, but it basically started from that 350 LC all the way to and a very short period of time uh, signing a factory contract with HRC. If you were to talk about it in modern terms, if you were going to do that again now, what would you? What would the career path be? <laughs> well, lots of people say it's not it's not possible now. It's just different now, and and it's, it's just this, if you want something, there's always ways of of making it happen. And sure, back then I I could ride that bike to race meetings uh, if I was lucky, not fall off, win some races get a few quid as you did at Not Kill because it's prize money and then ride home. So there's a, there's a lot of luck involved. And you obviously can't do that now. And but you could you could also go racing certainly on LCs on a on a working man's wage. Um, entries were, were cheap, running the bike was cheap, so it, it was it was possible, but it's different now and you obviously need more cash to fund it. But if you desperately want to go racing you'll find a way the information's out there, whether it's attracting sponsors, working hard, talking to people, you, you have to have some kind of personality. You have to have some something about you. You can't sit at home, hoping it will happen. And unless you win the lottery, it's not going to happen. So you just have to find to go out there, a way to go out there, make it happen. And yeah, cash is, is king, that, that is the key. So you've got to find a way to, to raise the money. Um, you're not going to go to the bank. They're not going to lend you the money. So you have to, you have to, you have to find a way. Whether that's going to your local dealer, your local enthusiast, friends, family, whatever. You just have to to find a way. But it's it's possible to make it happen. I mean, now in much more modern era, Cal Crutchlow, for me, is is the last guy that did that. I I remember when you and Taryn started racing. We're driving back from Knock Hill one day and uh, and there's Derek Crutchlow's dad sitting in a rough old van with a rougher caravan on the back. Cal's asleep in the passenger seat and they were basically went racing on a shoestring because his dad was helping them. They had no money. Cal had a dream and they just found a way to make it, make it happen. So if you would kind of relate that to to story in modern times, it would be interesting just to get the, the starting point for Carl Crutchlow and how it all happened because he was given nothing on the plate and, and I've seen him in the early days and they, they basically had nothing but they just found a way to get the momentum going, make it happen, work their way up through the classes and then and then he's become our most successful MotoGP rider since Barry Sheen. So it's 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 still possible, it's still possible to make it happen. Yeah. Just and I did a video last week on my training methods or my new <laughs> training methods you i think were actually a bit of a pioneer back in the day for training sometimes sometimes right, go on. so just talk me through your high because people have asked what mad mark th- would think of my training sessions i'm not asking mad mark i'm asking neil mckenzie yeah don't what, ask mad mark. uh your training involved back in the day <laughs> well tra- yeah again training now it's <laughs> It's not rocket science because it's all out there. It's accessible for everyone on the internet, whether it's nutrition, training, fitness, cardio, weights, whatever strength, you will find it out there. So, so, uh, but back in the day, in my day, no one knew anything about training. Paris, you know, the hole in the front of his helmet for cigarettes. So no one knew cigarettes were dangerous or it was a problem and and so cigarette smoking was all right that's all part of training the cigarettes were actually advertised that made you fitter so um i didn't really subscribe to that but yeah so training um i thought yeah it, i could do with being fit because it was physical on the bike a lot a lot of people think you just sit in the bike and it rides around itself it's so physically demanding as you know you, you, the bike's wanting to do what you're not wanting to do, whether it's braking, you're pushing back, you're accelerating, you're holding on, you're trying to heave it from side to side, you're just trying to make it do things it doesn't want to do. So I quickly realised the fitter I was, the better. And I also understood I'm not an engineer or very technical at all, but I understood the power to weight ratio and the lighter you were, the faster you went. So, um, on these few basics, I developed my training program. Some of it was right, some of it was wrong. So 
things I would do was, yeah, just basically not eat crap, go for a run, but there was no structure or program involved. Um, in the winter when I was going out, I wouldn't get the bus or a lift home. Our local pubs and places to go out were about a mile and a half away, so end the night, I'd just run home, <laughs> <laughs> which was uphill. <laughs> And we had a few drinks, it doesn't hurt as much. <laughs> so that's where it kind of started in 1981, the winter of 1981, on the first season. So I thought, it's less painful, um, I've had a good night, I'm quite happy, we'll run home, uh, which was a mile and a half uphill from Denny to Pankerton. And uh, and like, uh, hyperventilated by the time we get to my front door, because, because I'm half drunk, it didn't matter drenched with sweat so stagger in throw the clothes in the corner and get into bed and quite often it was a double bonus because our council house in Frankton was freezing we had no central heating there's frost on the windows as your mum would tell you when she first went there and and no electric blankets so it was just mint it was like having an electric blanket get into bed boiling whereas normally creeping into bed on a Scottish winter is hideous so there was that, and and when you think about it, heart rate must have been high, cardio advantages must have been good, and see, I was out of breath, so I must have been getting fit. So that's basically it did that. As that that developed into things that I don't think worked particularly as well, because I also thought that uh, if you're going to get fit, then if you're sweating, you're getting fit. So when I upgraded to having my own van, uh, Bedford CF van. In the summer, I would get in the van from work. Friday night, I'd be driving to a two-day club meeting at Cadwell Park. <laughs> no, <laughs> get no. in the van, it's summertime. Get in the van, pull on my parka and woolly hat, turn the heating up full and the blower on full and drive to Cadwell Park, sweating. Like... Politically correct, yeah. Well, this bit like, what, yeah. Uh, someone that enjoys cakes and okay. bakers, so uh, and then get to Cadwell Park, go to sleep, wake up the next day absolutely thirsty, thirsty all day, totally dehydrated, not feeling particularly strong, a bit weak because I basically wrecked myself for five hours the night before in the van. But I was sweating a lot, so I must have thought I was good. So it took about took probably half a year to find out that that wasn't the right thing. So some things I was doing, some things good, some things not so good. And it went from there. But yeah, I'll always make an effort. And, and yeah, and I did go running and train when I wasn't drinking alcohol as well, which uh, I'm sure had its benefits. Well, and as your racing progressed, you got slightly more serious over the years. <laughs> yeah, I did. And yes, and especially when we got to the... Yeah, I was drank less, partied less, certainly during the season, um, got more serious about training. And then when it came to the HRC time, they sent me to California um, for a couple of winters. Um, I worked here with a guy called Dean Miller, rode with Doug Chandler flat tracking. So we did we did a couple of months um, physical training in the gym, proper physical assessments, and, and, then, and then understood it. And so from 1987 onwards, um, I feel like I've kind of been in the window of being reasonably fit and understanding training properly. And and just on, on that, yeah. <laughs> I'll just finish that. And, and uh, yeah, because I'll add Mick doing in here a little bit, because Mick, although he grew up on the Gold Coast in Australia with quite a lot of fit sportsmen, triathletes and the like, when he first came, he used to see me go for a run now and again and didn't get it at all. And, uh, and then we'd become friends and then from... And then he kind of got it. So I'm quite proud that I introduced Mick to getting fitter, which was a mistake because then he got way too fit, fitter than I ever was and demolished the world in the in the world of 500 GPs. But there you go. You've got a good Mick doing training story that me and Taz, it's borderline, oh, it is Mad Mark territory. Right. Mick's training regime when he's in a hotel room. Oh, Mick's as mad as me and Mick will, yeah, Mick will now admit to, yeah, so... Which one do you want? I've when, got a few. Well, when he was in his hotel room just running. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, I mean, that 
it's just what athletes do because lately, or uh, more recently, with the, all the tennis players going to the Australian Open and having to be isolating in uh, hotels for two weeks when they got there, they're all they're, they're playing dummy tennis and running for miles on the spot in hotel rooms. And that's what Mick did when he was... Oh, I don't know why. Yeah, why was he? Because he wasn't isolated. Was in his hotel room. Yeah, maybe, maybe he didn't have any training gear. But yeah, but he, he used to do that on a regular basis, which is fair enough. To, to be honest, I always had my shorts and trainers, so I'd go and run 20 minutes one way and 20 minutes back to wherever hotel I was in the world. But anyway, Mick used to do it in, in his room, so he's maybe ahead of his time. And one time he had uh, he had a, a hand injury. He had some pins or steel or wire, I'm not sure which hand. And he, he was running in his room, and he must have been sprinting to the line at the end because he caught his hand on his uh, shorts and it dug in and pulled the pins or wire out. And the next day, his hand was in a mess, so he was going to see a medic and asked what happened. He saw jogging in my room you know what I was jogging in my room and I pulled it out so um, I'm just watching Taz outside riding he's <laughs> crashed but he's alright um, uh, so yeah Mick Mick used to run in his room that would be 1990 1991 so uh, yeah ahead of his time and another this time it's nutrition with Mick when he broke his leg badly in 1992 he was in hospital a long time, and Mick, like me, was, I mean, his body fat was, was ridiculously low, but he was paranoid about ever putting weight on, and I remember going to see him in hospital from time to time uh, in 92, and he looked gone, he looked really ill. Um, he, his leg was, was bad, but um, he decided that he would put weight on if he's not moving, which he couldn't because his legs were tied together. Then he would put weight on, and, and he, mentally Mick was stronger than anyone I've ever known. And he, he uh, I said, yeah, he said, oh, well, I'm, I can't eat because I'll put weight on. I said, all right, so what, you've got to eat something. He said, well, <laughs> so, and this sounds ridiculous, but it's true. I said, so what, what are you eating today? He says, a grape. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> one grape? Yeah, one grape. Right, okay, that's, that's probably not good for you. And but <laughs> Mick being Mick is a good friend. He, if he decided one grape a day was all he was having, then one grape. I mean, I yeah. So so there you go. I must admit, I've got a little bit of story like that. I remember one time I dated a journey in the van not that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't. I wanted to get home, so I you know, I two, two strips. So there's only two strips. So. so I've gone to the, yeah, two strips, so that's quite a good diet. And I know another diet, uh, Chan Hong Chu, his dad, when Chan Hong Chu, youngest ever, Moto 3 winner, was in the Red Bull Rookies, so what do commentate for the Red Bull Rookies? And uh, Chan and his brother are different. Dennis, Dennis is, is smaller, very slight. And Chan is quite bigger, stockier. And his dad, um, was aware that he was putting weight on when he was first year in the rookies and I was talking to him over dinner one night Chan wasn't eating anything I said are you not hungry no no I'm not hungry and uh, anyway he left and I was chatting away to his dad he said no he won't eat anything because I've got I've got him on the one egg diet I said alright what's yeah he's only allowed to eat one egg a day and when he's at the racing or I said he's probably not going to have as much energy as he should oh well that's what we're doing the one egg diet so is amazing. So uh, they on two dad, lovely guy, uh, but a little bit of mad mark in there, mm. as you can, as you can hear. Lovely tell. Mm. Um, I think I f we should make this a regular chat. I'm quite enjoying this. Yeah, we should things do a, you never knew. A regular feature on this. Um, let me just see how long we've been going. Twenty four minutes. Let me just start this and stop it. Twenty four minutes. I thought we'd only started. I know. We got to the good bit. Yeah, yeah I know. Wait. Right, my next. Um, we just talked about Mick then. You yeah. um, rode in, I guess, what's considered one of the best areas of MotoGP yes. the, in the unrideable era. And there were some amazing names and teammates you had over the years. But who, out of people you race against, was the best? Uh, as teammate or... Just or who was the best rider? The best? Well, I've got Mick doing unquestionably... 
I'll pick me. I'll pick me. But I'm going to say another right. I'll pick. I'll pick so many of them, I and mean, you could justify any one of them being the absolute best. Mick, his mental strength and his physical strength, and just the fact he won five world championships after um, a basically career-ending injury, which left him basically crippled. He couldn't really use his the bottom half of his right leg or his ankle. So to do what he did was, I think, was extra special. So he would. So who knows if he hadn't been injured, what he would have done? He could have been seven, eight world championships. So he 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 was incredible. But when he won his championships. Other amazing riders had already retired. Wayne Rainey, who was Mick, would, would have the utmost respect for, and he was a, a great uh, challenger and three times world champion, obviously had to retire with injury. He was amazing. Um, and who knows what he could have done. Uh, he was leading, he's leading a Grand Prix and the world championship when he, when he was paralysed in Mizano. So he, he certainly had a, a few other championships in him. Um, but another rider I know Mick respected a lot was Eddie Lawson and became good friends with him. And Eddie Lawson, for me, just ticked all of the boxes. He won four world championships on different makes of machinery, back-to-back Yamaha then Honda. He won Suzuki Air, he won Daytona, he won his home Grand Prix. He just ticked all the boxes and he, he, just, he was just under the radar. He didn't make a big fuss about it, he'd never tell you. He never talk about himself, about his achievements. He good guy, friendly guy. Didn't speak a lot to journalists, but he party as hard as any of us. Um, but he's just such an actual writer and did it. it. It was almost effortless how he how he did it. You look at likes Wayne Rainey or Mick Kevin Schwantz, another writer who should have won more world championships. They're they're all action. Uh, extreme riding styles and riding antics were were amazing even Kenny Roberts before them. But Eddie was just, he was called Steady Eddie, but he was on the limit. He just looked looked amazing. So Ed, Eddie, for me, was he certainly ticked all the boxes, but, but Mick was incredibly special in, in every area. And what about Spencer? Would you include Spencer in it or not? Yes, Freddie, I was involved, I was around Freddie a lot. I on and off because he was injured or coming in out of retirement. I was Freddie's teammate, 87, 88 and 89, but he wasn't around a, a lot of the time. Well, he, he was around, but he, he, he wasn't at his best. It wasn't godlike Freddie Spencer. Well, just explain who, that to people that don't know as well. Yeah, Freddie Spencer, Freddie Spencer uh, grew up flat tracking in America from Louisiana and, and if you look at his stats against Mark Marquez, his stats, like when he won races and how many he won, he, he did it a lot quicker and a lot earlier than, than Mark Marquez, which is incredible coming from America and winning Grand Prix and winning World Championships. So he, he just jumped on, on 500s and, and actually 750s before that. And it was just amazing, just a huge natural talent. And, and, um, yeah, so it, but it, his career was was tiny. It was only really lasted at its peak for for two or three years, in which time he won two five hundred world championships and one two fifty world championship. But F- Freddie was, uh, yeah, he was, yeah, he was incredible, like Mark Marquez, but didn't didn't crash, didn't he didn't he just did it, and he was just just amazing. He just kind of set, took the bar to a new level. Um, again, very, very quiet, um, very, very modest, but uh, put Honda back in the map and they came back into to 500 GPs and he, he just made everything look so easy and no one could really touch him when he was at his, his best. But he won the 250 and 500 World Championship in 1985, um, came back in, in 86 again with Rossmus Honda, just in the 500 Championship this year, but was leading the Spanish Grand Prix first round of the year and then pulled out with tendonitis or arm pump, which everyone tends to suffer from these days. And then and then made a few comebacks after that, after surgery, got injured, and then became less fit uh, and, and, and wasn't really prepared. Uh, his best physical shape when he came back, he came back again in 87, the first year I was with HRC, we tested together in Australia. He showed up two days late, uh, uh, as he did, um, 
myself and Gardner and Yasushiro did, did four days. Freddie did two days. With by the end of day one, he was faster than than all of us, and then he, and then he went home. And then I'm sure he was back big time that year, but he went to Daytona and got taken out in Daytona and got injured there. So then uh, came back to Suzuka, wasn't fit. And then he was kind of stopping and starting all over year with his career and fitness and he was putting on weight and he just wasn't in shape. And and so it, uh, it, it was tough for Freddie. I, I actually felt sorry for him. He was, um, he wanted to race, but he, he wasn't prepared and, and it just kind of went downhill from, from then on. But, um, watching him at his peak was, was, very special, but it was quite. It was a, his career went from zero to hero, but then only lasted two or three years. Yeah. And then, famously, Dad, in our family, um, Lorenzo moved to Honda, and you predicted him winning the championship. So, I. Races. I said he. I'm not sure about the championship. But right. Well, whatever you said, right. it was wildly wrong. Yeah. So now um, we. Uh, it was it was it was incredibly unlucky. <laughs> right. So this year, MotoGP's had a bit of a switch around. There's a lot of riders moving about. Oh yeah. I don't necessarily want your predictions, but who are you excited to watch this year, or who do you think is going to be good? Yeah, Brad Binder. Funny enough, someone asked me that earlier today, and I, I, I took an outside punt. It was a, one of these things where I had to fill in who's going to win the world championship, and I just picked Brad Binder. I mean, he he won Moto Three World Championship. He won almost won a Moto Two World Championship, and won a Moto GP race last year. And he, yeah, he, he's going to go close. Maybe not this year, but but he's going to take a big step. KTM took a massive step last year with a bike. Um, lots of podiums, three race wins. So, and, and Brad is a, he's just a huge talent and he's got all the tools in his toolbox when it comes to riding, fitness, mental strength, keeping his feet on the ground. I just think he's a complete package. So yeah, um, no one would have picked, uh, Mia to win the World Championship last year, so very few people will probably pick Brad Binder for this year, but I will. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited, but every one of these riders, you could get excited about what they're going to do this year. Um, I think KTMs will be good, so Liviera is going to be up there. Um, what about, question about, what? about Paul moving to Honda? Do you think that's a mistake or do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's going to be, it's good he has because it's so boring when everybody stays in the same teams year after year. So boring when I, Repsol did the team announcement the other day and the colours are like, here's the new bikes, so it's like, oh, they're the same. So it's great when there's 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 at least riders changing. Uh, Paul, I, I honestly thought watching Paul in early years in MotoGP, he was too aggressive and... It wasn't ever going to happen, but he proved me wrong, and he, he there's no reason why he couldn't have won a few last year, and he certainly was in the hunt most weekends. So, um, but I don't think Honda's user friendly. The the KTM grew and evolved with Paul Espigaro pretty much from from day one, and 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 they're a much more family accommodating type of team that would do what the riders need and. And I think it probably suits most riders better than, than HRC. There's only Mark Marquez that I guess HRC will do anything anything for, so I don't know. And and Mark Marquez is such a, an incredible talent. He's won all these world championships, and I don't think the bike was ever the best. He just made it happen. Mm. So I think it's difficult for any riders on the Honda because... Honda are a special, Alberto Pruge is a special person, they've got their own way of working and quite often won't move outside that, that window of the way they work, whereas, whereas other teams will be more accommodating for the riders and their particular riding styles or, or needs. So, uh, yeah, I think he would have had a better season staying with KTM, but, but if Honda ask you in, then you've got to consider it and you've got to 
difficult to, to, to look at doing it. And I think he made that decision when the KTM wasn't as good as it is now. So who knows yeah. if he would have made that decision three or four months later on. And what about Quattro moving to the factory team? Do you think that's going to help him or not? Yeah. Yeah, he, again, an, an amazing talent. And, and if you look at all the kind of details behind the scenes, it, it just looked like he had a, he kind of went off the boil. But I think there was lots of reasons for that as well. And and if he can, if he's capable of doing what he did in Jerez at the opening round, which was just totally dominate, um, then it's just a case of getting the bike right for him. Every circuit's just a series of corners, really, and, and everything just worked there. Um so I think it's just he's he's still very early in his multi GP kick multi GP career. So I think it's yeah, it's just learning from all their weaknesses and mistakes last year and and the small things that went wrong. Um again, who knows what the opposition will come out with, but Yamaha was seemed to be be, be in a much better place, won a lot of races last year, seemed to be a good package, not the fastest, but certainly the bike that could that worked well with the, the Michelin tires last year, the new Michelin's. So um yeah. But yeah, he's got yeah, it's just gonna be interesting. He's got Morbidelli to deal with, who was the strongest Yamaha rider at the end of the season. So who knows? But I think yeah, Quartararo, I don't think he's a championship favourite, but he's certainly a top three potential. Very good. Well, thank you for joining me, Dad. I forgot to explain at the start of this that I'm currently isolating, which is why we're doing this over FaceTime. I haven't actually got COVID, but I've come into contact with someone that did. So, and, that, go on. and that's why I slid pizzas under your door yeah. last night. <laughs> and the very nice pizza it was too. Right. So, yeah, I think... I'll, I haven't even scratched the surface. Well, I know. I'm just going to stop it now because we're... Right. I don't know how okay. far we're into this, but I think we should make this a regular feature if people yeah. enjoy it. And we I've could, got so much to talk about. I so know. Much, and that, there's so a lot of... BS in my brain. Stories that I want to talk about. And I thought we could react to um, motorcycle news... Not motorcycle news, but news within the motorcycle industry during the year. It'd be something yeah. to talk about. Yeah, it could yeah, be a regular yeah. feature. Johnny Ray offered yeah. to do a podcast with me, but... As nice as an offer it was, I feel Johnny might get quite busy during the year, whereas you're always in the same household as me. Yeah. So we could do lots of this during the year. Um, well, thanks, Dad. Ciao. I don't know what else to say. I'll uh, see you soon. Oh, Go last on. thing. Have you got... You might notice I've got a beard. Oh, I'll yeah. I forgot to ask about that. Well, that you, mom, you, my wife said, grow a beard and you look like George Clooney. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't Who's he? I'm Bin Man. So, watch this space. <laughs> right. Uh, have you got anything you want to plug while you're on? Normally you want to try and sell something. Um, it's springtime. You're digging your bikes out. You need to insure them. <laughs> Neil Hodgson and Neil McKenzie have an insurance company called Mackenzie Hodgson. Let us give you a quote. Become part of the family and you will be in the draw for a brand new CCM Spitfire 6. Fact. Someone's going to win it. Someone's, Someone's got to win it. to win it at the NEC in December. Yeah. All right. There's your plug. You can have that plug for free. Right. I, like, I like this. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Dad. Right. See you in a bit. Ciao. Bye bye. bye. Ciao.